As a professional cook and baker, I know a lot of things that are definitely true about biscuits. For instance, biscuits are always nice and buttery. A good biscuit is a flaky biscuit. If you don't use a super low protein flour, your biscuits will bake up tough. Okay, who's doing that? Anyway, one truth that cannot be refuted is that to make good biscuits, you have to keep all of your ingredients nice and cold. Okay, okay, I get it. I was wrong about all of that. Man, that's annoying. Look, the truth is, some biscuits don't contain butter at all. Others are better made with a higher protein flour. And some, instead of having flakiness, trade on an almost cake-like tenderness. And as we'll learn in this episode, sometimes heating things up is better than keeping them cold. The world of biscuits is surprisingly complex and varied. Hard and fast rules break down quickly as we move between biscuit styles, but we have to get our bearings somehow. What if I told a tale of two biscuits? One would be the flakiest, tallest, most ultra butteriest biscuit you've ever seen. And the other, the easiest to make, plushest, most tender biscuit you've ever laid eyes on. Those two styles of biscuit, ultra flaky versus ultra tender and cakey, couldn't be more different. And yet, their ingredient lists start out remarkably similar. Each begins with three cups of all-purpose flour, and then incorporates roughly equal amounts of sugar, baking powder, baking soda, and salt. Let's do a quick rundown on each of these ingredients. First up, flour. Now we're using an all-purpose flour for both of these recipes, but the traditional choice for biscuits is a low-protein all-purpose flour that is also bleached. Lower protein plus bleaching means a flour that has really low gluten-forming potential, and that leads to baked goods that are really tender and have less rise and lift. But here's the thing, there's more than one way to make a tender baked good, and extreme tenderness isn't always best depending on the biscuit style. Next up is sugar. Now sugar is obviously sweet, but the amount we're using in these recipes is so little you wouldn't even notice it. So why include it at all? Well, sugar's primary function in these biscuits is to improve browning. And as we talked about with cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and burgers, better browning equals better flavor. Next is baking powder. Now baking powder contains baking soda, which is alkaline, plus at least one acidic ingredient. When dry, the baking soda and acids remain separate and totally uninterested in one another. But just like with gremlins, when you get them wet, they multiply. Wait, that's not right. When they get wet, they react and create carbon dioxide, which leavens the biscuit. So if we're adding baking powder, which contains baking soda, and we know that that combination is already giving lift to the biscuit, why are we adding additional baking soda? Well, that additional baking soda will actually raise the pH of the dough. And all those delicious browning reactions happen faster at higher pH. So we add baking soda, and we get better browning. The baking soda also seasons the biscuits directly. The slightly salty, savory taste of baking soda is a key component in things like pancakes, and you guessed it, biscuits. If it wasn't in there, you would notice. And finally, salt, that's there entirely for seasoning, and a little bit goes a long way. If, however, you're interested in seeing me eat an entire spoonful of salt, I do highly recommend my video on how to make sea salt. So far, our tale of two biscuits sounds an awful lot like a tale of one biscuit, which is still a tale I would tell, it just doesn't have quite the same panache. Well, fear not. Things are about to diverge and get really, really dramatic. To help me tell the rest of this story, I've invited two baking pros to join me in the kitchen. Cook's Illustrated Deputy Food Editor, Andrea Geary, and Cook's Illustrated Senior Editor, Andrew Janjigian. Each brings with them decades of recipe development and baking experience, and their own recipes. Let's go to the kitchen. Andrew will be making his ultimate flaky biscuits, and Andrea will be making her easiest ever biscuits. First up, ultra flaky Andrew. Before we start baking, let's look at some stats. Andrew's got all of those dry ingredients that we just talked about in one bowl, and into it, he's grating two sticks of slightly frozen butter. Why frozen grated butter? So that the pieces of butter stay individual in the, inside the dough so that the layers will form and it'll get real flaky, basically. A biscuit will bake up flaky when sheets of dough are separated by sheets of fat. I could say the same thing about a croissant or even puff pastry, and that makes sense. In each instance, we're talking about lamination, which is a fancy term for basically sandwiching layers of fat and dough together. In a croissant, the lamination is extensive and done with meticulous care to ensure ultra-thin layers of both dough and fat. Biscuit lamination is a much more rustic affair. For super flaky biscuits, we add grated butter and then roll and fold the dough until that fat is distributed in layers. Now he adds chilled buttermilk. Now the water in the buttermilk will hydrate the flour and get some crucial gluten formation going. Then he dumps the dough onto the counter and it looks, whoa, this looks really dry. Is this actually gonna come together into a biscuit dough? Yes. 
all thanks to folding. A little bit like laminating? Yeah, it's exactly like laminating. This is basically a biscuit married to a croissant. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Andrew rolls the dough out into a rectangle and then folds it up like a business letter. He then turns it 90 degrees and repeats that, and repeats that, and repeats that, and repeats that. That's five sets of folds, but just look at that transformation. After a quick chill, he uses a sharp floured knife to trim the dough and then cut it into nine beautiful, beautiful squares. Then we bake these off and just look at those layers. We gotta do one of those like gratuitous pan up shots all the way. Yeah, that's nice. Next up is Andrea, and the easiest biscuit recipe you'll ever see. But first, some stats. Andrea set out to make the easiest ever biscuit, and that meant two things. First, it had to be a drop biscuit. A drop biscuit means the dough is wet enough that it can be scooped straight from the mixing bowl and dropped onto the baking sheet. No rolling, folding, or cutting required. And second, it had to be a cream biscuit. Instead of cutting in cold butter and then adding in cold milk or buttermilk, you sub in one ingredient, heavy cream, which contains about 36% fat and 57% water. That's one ingredient that provides all of your fat and water requirements. So this is kind of a, a drop biscuit and a cream biscuit, so together it's a dream biscuit. So the first step is Andrea takes that heavy cream and throws it in the microwave for about a minute on high power and wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to keep everything nice and cold for these biscuits. For this recipe you actually warm up the cream because this is both our fat and our liquid. So here's the thing. Cream might look like a liquid, but when it's cold, the butter fat in it is solid. If you add enough cold cream to make a droppable dough, the biscuits will look fine before they go in the oven. But once all that butter fat melts in the heat of the oven, your biscuit flattens out into a pancakey looking biscuit thing. The microwave step brings the cream up to about 95 degrees, which melts that butter fat. It makes the cream more fluid. Now that she has her warmed cream, just check out how easy and fast this is. Check out that gorgeous browning and that tender, plush interior. Whether you go ultra, ultra flaky or super easy and tender, I think we can all agree that this is definitely how to eat biscuits. So, are you flaky or easy? I mean, your biscuit preference. Let me know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time.